You may be seated. And Steve Mays is now coming, the bionic man, to share with us living a holy life. Hey, are we doing good? All right, great to see you guys. What a blessing, Raul's message was so profound and so heart touching. Just an um, amazing gift God's given him of total repentance, amen? Amen, amen. Father, we are thankful that God, that we can come before you at any time to see your hand of kindness upon our life. And that, Lord, oftentimes we are so confused at some of the things that happen to us. And God, oftentimes we forget how holy you are. And so I pray this morning that this study would be just exactly what we need and that, Father, you would teach us something that we might shoot for, that you would make us men of great maturity, of great integrity, of great humility, and great victory. And we will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I came across this little story, speaking about holiness. It's about a little bird named Chipper. This is little Chipper was having singing, singing her heart out one day, and she was just had joy in her heart, and she never saw what was coming. One second, she was peaceful, perched in her cage, sending a song into the air, filled the living room with a sweet song, and the next second, she was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. Her problem began when Pastor Rawl, her owner, decided to clean the cage with a vacuum. <laughs> Rawl had just stuck the nozzle inside to pick up the seed and feather at the bottom of the cage, trying to help, of course, Sharon out at home. When the cell phone rang, he turned to pick it up. Hey, Raul, Pastor Chuck here. Raul became so nervous, he barely said hello, when all of a sudden he heard swip, swip, flip, flip, gone, Chipper got sucked in. Rob was horrified, or Raul was horrified, gasping for and grabbing everything, hoping to find the switch, drop the phone, and finally got the thing turned off. He opened the bag, his mouth was wide open. There was Chipper, still alive, stunned, but her mind was gone. Chipper, such a beautiful bird from Chile, now covered with heavy gray must and dirt. Raul grabbed little Chipper, rushed him upstairs to the bathtub, turned on the faucet full blast, held Chipper upside down under the torn of ice cold water. He had just powered washed poor little Chipper clean. Then it dawned on him that Chipper was soaking wet and shivering. So out of his beloved heart, Rawl, in tears, went down as any bird lover would do, grabbed a hair dryer, put it on full blast, and blew the feathers off of little Chipper. <laughs> feathers were flying, but Chipper wasn't moving. Then Chipper went crazy. You ask, did he survive? Yes, he did, thank God, for Sharon's sake. But he doesn't sing much anymore in Pastor Rawl's house. He just kind of sits there staring at you with a blank stare. I'm sure if he could tell you what had happened, he would tell Rawl and everyone else. But what's so sad is every once in a while, old little Chipper begins to twitch and jerk and rob and Raul tells everyone, oh, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't you believe it? <laughs> Chipper was sucked in, blown down, and washed out. He had a bad day. You know, sometimes in our lives, we have bad, bad days, and sometimes we can even have some bad, bad years. And I think that one of the great things about a life of holiness is that you are going to be tried no matter what happens in your life at every given turn, because God loves you so much. And I think if I am going to teach on the life of holiness, I'd have to say that the best way that I can teach it is probably through one of the great Bible characters of the Old Testament. Someone who has been tried. Someone who has 
gone through unbelievable moments in his life, tested beyond human belief, challenged to the breaking point, and devastated till nothing makes sense. And then at the same token, someone who had been extremely victorious, always looking to God. Now maybe he didn't really see the goodness of God, but he never lost the faith in God, and that's an important issue. And his name is none other than Job. When I think of a life of holiness, I think Job, before the Bible was there, before the Holy Spirit was inside of him, there was something unique about the man. He had a fear of God, an understanding of God. And the book really is not about suffering. It really is not about some of the hard things we go through in life. Over 300 questions Job is asking, and God really does not answer any of them. We find that Job finds the answer in the life of Christ as the daysman. But what is interesting to me, it talks about the sovereignty of God, that God allows things to happen. And it's in those moments we go through these horrific moments of our life. It could be a wife, or it could be that you're really upset with someone on the board, or maybe someone at work, or maybe you just feel like cussing, or all of a sudden you're going to tell a teacher how you feel. Those are the moments that God has allowed people to push your buttons. And you need to remember the book of Job often is taught wrong. It's a book about God. And out of 44 times the word almighty is used, 33 times it's used in the book of Job. And what is interesting, when I was studying it this time, I found out again that it opens in the throne room of God. And there Satan is there. And he is there giving an account to God. So the first thing I begin to understand is that Satan is going to have to bow before God. Not only that, is that God is going to bring limitations upon Satan. And God is going to manifest Satan's heart. Have you considered my servant Job? And it was in the heart of Satan to go after Job, and God knew that. But it was in the heart of God to choose Job because that was the message and that was the instrument and that was the missile that God had chosen and ordained to destroy the power of Satan. And the challenge today in your life and in mine is no matter what we go through in my life, my health, and your life, something else, how do I know that God did not allow these things to happen for one reason and one reason only. That as I look to God and trust God, God's going to give me incredible victory in my life. And Satan does not have that power. He is submitting to God in heaven. He has to yield the power under a certain limitation. And then you remember, he has to come back, show up one more time. So first of all, God is on the throne, amen? Satan is not. And so maybe today, the buttons we have and the things that happen in our life, maybe the adversary is saying, you know, if you let me go after his wife and make you know, her drive him crazy, he'll curse you to the day he dies. And God will simply say, I believe in Steve, I believe in you, go for it. And now it comes really a personal moment of obedience in my life. If I yield my life to holiness, if I begin to live in obedience, if I'm going to be loving and humble before God, then I'm going to look to God. And when I look to God, then God is going to get the credit. You have to remember, and one day Job lost everything. He was the wealthiest man in all the East. And in one moment, he lost the stock market, or we would say back then, he lost his camels and his sheep. Before that even got done, then his kids were killed. There were seven boys and three girls, and they were killed. And then you remember, his wife came, and bless her heart, she said, honey, curse God and die. You know, you just need to die. One day I was upset with Gail, and I said, honey, I found out the name of Job's wife. 
And she goes, who's that? I said, Gail. <laughs> well, that was the end of that. What could I say? And then, of course, the most important thing was the friends, Bildad and Zophar and Eliphaz. And these were wicked men. In other words, they did nothing to encourage him, but they basically destroyed him for some 30, some chapters. And then finally, God came after him himself. And though he lost, really, the sight of God, he never lost the faith of God. And what you need to understand is that God was stripping him. God was taking him down to a point because God was now going to use him in a way that he didn't understand. And I personally believe today that God wants to use you. And you can look at your work, and you can look at your job, and you can look at your pulpit, and you can make a whole bunch of mistakes if you do not see that God allows things to happen. But if you believe that God allows things to happen, then you have to believe that God has brought you for this moment, for this time, for such a time as this. And when that happens, then there's only one thing you can do. You need to be victorious. And God, this is my body, this is my mind, and though you slay me, I'm gonna trust you for the rest of my life. And this is what God said of Job. He said in Job chapter one, verse eight, and the Lord said unto Satan, has thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in all the earth. And notice four things, he is perfect and he is upright. He's one that fears God and he ones that excludes evil or he hates evil. In other words, you can destroy his life, you can take everything away from him, you can make him have a bad day or horrible week, you can make his body cave in, his eyes be sunken in, you can make his bones pop out. You can put him out in the city dump. You can have his wife curse him and his friends mock him, but this man will not budge because he's a holy man before me. Now I'm telling you, God is placing that much faith in your heart and your life. And what we need to do, amen. God is trusting you in the life that he's given to you. But when I don't see God, or I'm out of God's word, things begin to fall apart. You know, listen just for a moment, and then I'm gonna give you four things to really think about. Listen for a moment, some of the answers this man gave. Number one, in Job 1, 5, and it was so, when the days of their fasting was gone, feasting was gone, that Job sent and sanctified them. He rose up early in the morning. In other words, when his kids were out, this man, was now seeking God, he was sacrificing, and he was sanctifying his kids. So from the very beginning, as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, he was no leader, he was no governor, he was not a prophet, he was a very wealthy multi-billionaire that had enough sense in his life that all of a sudden, he better bring his kids before God. Then it says in chapter one, verse 20, then Job arose and he rent his clothing, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshiped, and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gives and the Lord takes, blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, he did not sin with his lips foolishly. In other words, very important, God, you gave me the children. That means you are the provider. And the kids are the gift. And if the giver wants to give gifts, he has a right to take them back. And that's exactly what he did. And so he never took his eyes off of the giver. And that day, God took the gifts. And so what did he say? He opened his heart, he lifted his hands, and he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked I came in, naked I go out, blessed be the name of God. And then the day his wife came and said, listen, you need to curse God and die. And this is what he said to her in Job 2 verse 10. But he said unto her, thou speaketh as one foolish woman speaketh. What shall we receive of God at the hand of God? Shall we not receive good and evil? 
In other words, honey, we need to understand that God is balanced and God is going to bring good and evil in our life. And when good comes, we're going to worship him. And when horrible things come, we're going to worship him. And some of you are saying, now wait, time out. How do you get here? And the answer is you need to understand it's a right relationship with God. When all of a sudden, God can say to you, and God can say to me, have you noticed my servant Stephen? He's one that fears God. He is upright. He's one that is perfect. And he's one who hates evil. Great things are going to happen in your life. And one of the cool things is that God is going to begin to pick you to do great exploits for, before him. Because now he knows that he has someone that can destroy the power of Satan simply through a life of obedience by trusting in God himself. And here we find one more verse in Job 13, verse 15. He says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In other words, he never gave up on God. Though we watch his life in one moment lose the wealth and lose his family and lose his health and lose everything, he never lost the most important thing, his faith in God. Yes, he lost the goodness of God. He couldn't see what God was doing. He couldn't see how God was working behind the scenes. And in fact, we get to see that. We know that Satan and God were in heaven and they were talking about Job. And Job one day was at Starbucks having a great day. And when God and Satan got done, it was a bad day for Job. His whole life fell apart. But I want to encourage you more than ever before. I believe there's something that God wants to teach us. And I want to give you four things in just chapter 1, verse 8. He mentions about this man, Job, about holiness. And I was thinking, how can I package this in a way that you could take it home? Not negative, but more positive. And there are four ways I think God gave it to me. Number one, he had maturity. That means he was perfect. He was complete. Secondly, there was integrity. In other words, he was upright. He was forthright. Third, there was complete humility in his life. He was willing to fear God. And lastly, he was victorious because he hated evil and he loved God. So I want to do those four quickly before I quit. I want us to be men of maturity, men of integrity, men of humility, and men of victory. Let's say the first one together, men of maturity, men of integrity, men of humility, and men of victory. Amen? Let's look at the first, men of maturity. What does it mean? Very simply, it means to be complete in the Hebrew or to be completely done. It means to be devoted or unblemished or blameless. In the Greek, it means to be full grown or to be fully developed. In other words, there's no distractions in your life. And I think that's exactly what happened. When all of a sudden you're going down this way and God decides that this is the day that he has chosen to bring you to a greater understanding of who he is, he doesn't ask your permission. He does things in your life that are very difficult. And when you can look at them and you can hold on to God and your life is not going to be double whammy, and you're not going to be double-minded. You're going to fall, and you're going to hurt, and there's going to be pain, but you're not going to lose your faith. And the reason why is because of great maturity. You're convinced in your own heart that God has made you complete through the Word of God. And so we see that word, maturity, it means to be a full age, to be able to identify situations. You get in a fight with your wife, and all of a sudden, she's upset. What do you do? You don't match her. You turn a soft answer and turn away that. You understand that you cannot let wrath go down at night. Maturity brings us back to God. And that's all he had most of the times. 
when you're suffering, you will walk away from God. And many people believe that 80% of the people, when they suffer, they do not turn to God. They become very angry. And I kind of understand that. When I came down with cancer, I had a little difficult time with God. When I had my legs cut in half, had a little bit of difficult time with God. But I've come to understand that God knew exactly what he was doing. And it was the maturity of the word of God that was able to keep me in the ball game and not to lose focus on God. So number one is I need that maturity. So when God turns and goes a different way, or when God begins to humble you, or God begins to build you up, or God begins to show you something, or God begins to want to use you as a generational example for a next generation because he wants to use you to destroy Satan so the whole world can see how it's done, then you have to be very special. So it's not that God doesn't love you, it's that God's chosen you and God's bragging on you and God's in heaven saying, have you checked him out? There's nobody like this man. And Satan says, bring that hedge down. And God said, go for it. Now, I don't like it. I wish he wouldn't do it. I wish he'd go prove somebody else. Let him go pick on Raw a little bit, you know? Not me or Skip Isaac, but, you know, get the thing back up. But when God says, bring it down, bring the hedge down, because the warfare is now going to start, what do I do with my life? I need to be able to stand, but God, I don't sense you. I don't see you. But God, in my heart, though you slay me, I'm not going to leave you. And though I came in naked, I'm going to go out naked. And honey, God gives good and evil. In other words, he had the word of God to bring maturity. The second thing I find, not only was maturity, he could turn to God, but secondly, he had integrity. In other words, he could hold on to God. And it says here, he was upright. And the word means to be straight or unchanging standards or forthright or correct. In other words, God was on the throne and Satan was moving and God was working. But no matter what happened, Job was not going to budge. And Paul said that. He said, none of these things moved me. Neither did I count my life dear that I might finish that course with joy, the ministry that God has set before me. Do you understand that? None of these things are going to move me. Why? Because I want to finish this thing with joy because God took my life and changed me. Yesterday, there was a woman, 89 years old. Her name was Shirley. She had a husband named Henry. Those were the people that picked me up out of the street back in 1970 and took me to Costa Mesa. So I called her on her birthday. Her husband has died. And I said, Shirley, this is Steve, you remember? She goes, I've never forgot you. We walked out of our house and there you were. And Pastor Chuck taught that night before, we're gonna entertain angels. And we looked at you and you looked like a hell's angel, so we took you, you know? <laughs> And so what's so interesting to me is that they took me in and here all of a sudden I just said to her, all the fruit in my life has gone to your account because you listened to the word of God. They had integrity. They were willing to step out and pick up and do things. And in other words, no matter if Job's friends forsook him, if his friends came against him, if his wife came against him, listen to me, he didn't move. And what happens with men is when we are rejected, we walk away from God. We need to understand when Christ was rejected, he never walked away from anybody. He stood there upon the cross and he took the rejection for the glory of God. Amen? So hang in there. I think when you look at Christ and as he was on that cross bleeding and going through difficult times. Two things he taught me. In the midst of that, he built a relationship. He said, mom, behold your son, son, behold your mom. In other words, he wasn't too sick and he didn't go through too much to build a relationship. And secondly, check it out, 
no matter how much he was hurting, he could still forgive. And when you can forgive and you can build a ministry, no matter how you feel, that is what God's looking for. So there's no excuse. I get angry, I still have to minister. I get hurt, I still have to love. I go through difficult times, I still need to be forgiving. I cannot allow the integrity to go. So number one, there had to be great maturity, but number two, there had to be great, great integrity. And then number three, he had great, great humility. I read here in chapter one, verse eight, that he fears God. And I have to say, if there is something missing today in our generation, it is this fear of God. The reason why there are splits in churches, the reason why there are divorces, the reason why there are lawsuits, the whole reason going on is because people have lost the fear of God. They are not thinking of the consequences of what they've done. And when I lose the fear of God, I'm going to make bad decisions. Let me give you an example. If Gail and I got in a fight, and all of a sudden I was traveling with Chuck, and we had separate rooms, and some gal knocked on the door, and I thought maybe I could get away with it, I couldn't, and I wouldn't. Why? Not because Chuck is next door, because God's in my heart. And though God's in my heart, I know exactly what would happen. If I tried to do it, no one would find out. But all of a sudden, one day, I'd be at South Bay preaching, and we just got back from Africa. That's where Chuck and I went, and we were there preaching. And all of a sudden, one of the natives people came, got saved, and their relative lives in Carson, and they came to visit, and their relative lives, guess where, in Carson, and they go to Calvary Chapel, and so let's go see Pastor Steve. And so they bring this friend, and there she is sitting in the front row. And she looks up and she says, you're that guy that went to bed with me. I don't put that past God one moment. I fear God. And I'm telling you that the greatest thing in all your life that can hold you together, that can keep you on going on the road, that can hold your job together, hold your marriage together, hold your marriage together, is that you would fear God with all your heart because it makes you think different. And I just pray that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is just gonna be given to us, but I'm almost afraid that God's looking once again for those who fear him. And so here is a man who was holy. He had maturity. He could see God. He could come to God. He could trust God. And then here was a man who had tremendous holiness. He had integrity. He could hold on to the very things he needed to. But also, he was a man of holiness because he could fall down before God. He could humble himself. He could hold on to his words. He could come back to God. And though everything fell apart, he could hit the dirt and begin to serve. And you know the story. God said, stand up and answer me as a man. And when God got done, Job fell down. He was a man that was able to fall before his God. And that tells me he could surrender and he could yield and he could listen. And God was the Lord of his life. You see, it's one thing to have maturity. It's another thing to have integrity. But if I don't have the humility, the fear that's gonna bow my knee and hold me back and let me think of the consequences of cause and effect, if I do this, is this gonna happen? It's gonna mess me up. And lastly, as I wind up this morning, lastly, he was also one who has incredible, incredible victory. It says here in verse 8 of chapter 1, he excluded evil or he hated evil. In other words, he just simply loved God. He hated evil. He wanted nothing to do with it. When his kids were out messing around, he went out and covered them by God's mercy. He was constantly looking. And in some ways, as I've looked at this book, there is a little kind of a hint. One of the counselors said to Job, the thing that you fear the most came upon you. Well, maybe Job did fear. Maybe there was a little bit of fear that he might lose everything. He was a wealthy man. 
Everyone was seeking to take it away. Maybe that was there. I don't know. But I know this, that when it came down to the nitty-gritty, when one day he woke up and lost everything, he lost his family, he lost his wealth, he lost everything that he had, his position, his power, his authority. He even lost his friends and his own esteem. There's one person he never, ever lost, and that was God. And so because of that, he was able to say, no, Satan, I'm not going to give in. Though God slays me, you will never have my life. And I think you and I need to start thinking this way. Your bodies were made to be the temple of the living God. And one of the last places you have to hang on to is your flesh. And when Mary said, do unto this body as you will, I think that's the greatest move of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God, this is my body. God, these are my eyes. God, this is what you want to do. Do what you want. But don't let these eyes go after things that are not pleasing to you. It says of Job, make a covenant with your eyes. It says of David, search my heart and see my heart. But God help me to say no. And I'll tell you what, David didn't. David couldn't say no to sin. And it cost him a tremendous debt. Most people don't realize that when he went to bed with Bathsheba, it was Ahithophel's granddaughter. That's why Ahithophel turned, because one unholy act destroyed a family and destroyed a life. And sometimes we deal with pastors, and one unholy moment of drugs destroys everything. Or one moment of pleasure, the pastor looks and says to Chuck and I, you know, how soon can I get back in the ministry? And what they don't understand is they lost character. They lost character. Now, you can take reputation from me, and you can talk about me, and people will do that back and forth, but I'm the only one that can destroy my character. You're the only one that can destroy your character. And so when we talk about being holy, in this generation right now, my prayer is that no matter what God is going to do in you, and through you and around you. I want God to say to you, to Chuck, to myself, to Raul, have you seen such a faithful group of guys, how they are absolutely faithful to me? And secondly, how they have integrity, they have uprightness of heart. They're not playing games. And thirdly, they fear me because they're willing to fall before me. And lastly, I love these guys because they hate evil, but they love my word. Amen? Amen. Well, Father, we thank you. And we praise you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace in our life. And we thank you, Lord, for just the work of holiness. And I thank you, Lord, for the lessons you've taught me. How that, God, that sometimes we lose your goodness, but, God, we can never lose your faithfulness. And, God, sometimes we look around and we say, God, where are you? But we are never to lose our faith in who you are. And God, you opened up in chapter 1 as the almighty God, and you put Satan in his place. And then you chose your very faithful servant, Job. And I pray today that God, as you look upon us, that you would choose us, that through our life of obedience, we would destroy the power of darkness and we would walk in the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all the guys said, amen. God bless you guys.